Welcome to Literary and Jury Charge Practice. Let's start out with some jury charge. Ready? Here we go. If you find for the gay parties on their copyright infringement claims, you must determine the gay party's damages. The gay parties seek a statutory damage award established by Congress for each work they claim was infringed. Its purpose is to penalize the infringer and deter future violations of the copyright laws. The amount you may award as statutory damages is not less than $750 nor more than $30,000 for each work you conclude was infringed. However, if you find the infringement was innocent, you may award as little as $200 for each work innocently infringed. However, if you find the infringement was willful, you may award as much as $150,000 for each work willfully infringed. Instructions numbers 39 and 40 will tell you what constitutes innocent infringement and what constitutes willful infringement. The gay parties claim ownership of two copyrights and seek damages against the thick parties for copyright infringement. The thick parties deny infringing the copyrights. To help you understand the evidence in this case, I will explain some of the legal terms you will hear during this trial. The owner of a copyright has the right to exclude any other person from reproducing preparing derivative works, distributing, performing, displaying, or using the work covered by copyright for a specific period of time. Copyrighted work can be a literary work, musical work, dramatic work, pantomime, choreographic work, pictorial work, graphic work, sculptural work, motion picture, audiovisual work, sound recording, architectural work, mask works, fixed, in semiconductor chip products or a computer program. Facts, ideas, procedures, processes, systems, methods of operation, concepts, principles, or discoveries cannot themselves be copyrighted. However, how an author expresses ideas or concepts may be protected by copyright. For example, single words and ordinary phrases are not protected by copyright, but the original expression of words or phrases may be copyrighted. The copyrighted work must be original. A work may be original even if it contains unoriginal parts and the original selection and arrangement of otherwise uncopyrighted parts may be copyrighted. An original work that closely resembles other works can be copyrighted so long as the similarity between the two works is not the result of copying. The owner of the copyright may obtain and register the copyright by delivering to the Copyright Office of the Library of Congress a copy of the copyrighted work. After examination and a determination that the material deposited constitutes copyrightable subject matter and that legal and formal requirements are satisfied, the Register of Copyrights registers the work and issues a Certificate of Registration to the copyright owner. The works claimed by the gay parties in this case are the musical compositions got to give it up and after the dance. At the time the copyright in each of these works was separately obtained and registered, only written music could be filed by a copyright owner with the Copyright Office as the deposit copy of the copyrighted work. A deposit copy is paper on which Notes, lyrics, and other musical elements are written in a notation understandable to musicians. Recordings of musical compositions could not be filed with the Copyright Office at that time. Therefore, although sound recordings of Got to Give It Up and After the Dance were made and released commercially, 
those particular recordings are not at issue in this case, were not produced into evidence, and were not played for you during the trial. Instead, you have heard testimony from one or more witnesses from each side about what each thinks is shown on the deposit copy for each composition. You have also heard recorded versions of each work that each side has prepared based on what each side contends is shown in the deposit copy that was filed with the Copyright Office. Again, these are not the same as the recorded versions that were released commercially, although the version of one of the songs prepared by the gay parties includes certain parts of what was commercially released. You, also, you have also heard one or more witnesses use keyboards to play what each says appears on the deposit copy. In other instruction, I gave you directions about not doing any research about this case while serving as a juror. This included not listening to any of the music that is at issue other than what was played here in the courtroom while we were in session. In this case, the gay parties contend that the thick parties have infringed the gay parties' copyright. The gay parties have the burden of proving by a preponderance of the evidence that the gay parties are the owners of the copyright and that the thick parties copied original elements of the copyrighted work. Preponderance of the evidence means that you must be persuaded by the evidence that it is more probably true than not true that the copyrighted work was infringed. To prove that the thick parties copied the gay parties' work, the gay parties may show that the thick parties had access to the gay parties' copyrighted works and that there are substantial similarities between the thick parties' works and the gay parties' copyrighted works. One who reproduces, prepares derivative work forms, distributes, or performs a copyrighted work without authority from the copyright owner during the term of the copyright infringes the copyright. The thick parties contend that there is no copyright infringement. There is no copyright infringement where the thick parties independently created the challenged work. The gay parties are the owners of valid copyrights in the musical compositions Got to Give It Up and After the Dance. If the gay parties prove by a preponderance of the evidence that the gay parties' works are original, the gay parties acquired the copyrights in Got to Give It Up and After the Dance as the heirs of Marvin Gaye and the original owner of the copyrights in Got to Give It Up and After the Dance deposited copies of the works with the United States Copyright Office when the copyrights were registered. An original work may include or incorporate elements taken from prior works, works from the public domain, or works owned by others with the owner's permission. this. But for now, let's try some literary material. And let's see here. This is called Magnificent Mosaic. At 150, Canada celebrates its rich multicultural heritage. So 
so we'll give this a try. Ready? Here we go. Although it straddled a continent, Canada was just a loose knit of British colonies until nationalist impulses and outside forces, such as America's acquisition of Alaska in March 1867, led New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and what was then called Canada, Ontario, and Quebec to form an independent dominion under the Constitution Act of 1867. That action took place in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island on July 1, now Canada Day. There had long been American movements to annex Canada to the United States, and the British and Canadians realized they needed to protect their interests, says Lee A. Farrow, a history teacher at Auburn University at Montgomery in Alabama. Today, 10 provinces and three territories comprise this dominion of more than 36 million people and 3.9 million square miles. Three of the planet's five major oceans wash Canada's shores. It has apples, artichokes, cacti, polar bears, rattlesnakes, salmon, vineyards, walruses, whales, and zucchini. Canada's residents are crazy about hockey and golf. The country's, country's heritage ranges from Inuit to Athabascan to East Indian and Hindustani, along with English, Irish, Scots, and French. The land of the maple leaf recognizes two official languages, English and French, and its citizens speaks, speak hundreds more. In 1911, it created the world's first national parks agency and its status as the terminus of the Underground Railroad for escaping American slaves marked its long-standing dedication to fairness, freedom, and safety. No country in the world has more often sought to be multicultural than Canada, observes famed geographer-explorer Wade Davis, who teaches cultural anthropology at the University of British Columbia. Immigration policies, a welcoming attitude toward refugees, and Canada's membership in the 52-member Commonwealth of Nations all have bolstered the country's diversity. Toronto and Vancouver lay claim to more than 90 languages among their citizens. Half of Toronto's residents were born outside Canada. In Richmond, Vancouver's southern suburb, the Highway to Heaven, a two-mile stretch of Number 5 Road, has more than 20 houses of worship representing Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, and Sikh faiths. Leaders of the various temples, mosques, and churches on this thoroughfare delight in telling visitors that, among other things, their proximity enables shared parking as official days of worship vary among the faiths. Under Canada's multicultural society are the First Nations. We First Peoples have forgotten that we were this continent's original business people, says Theo Asu, business development manager of the Hada Enterprise Corporation, a quasi-public agency whose businesses include wilderness guest lodges in Hada Gwai, the Hada home islands off the North British Columbia coast. Long before Europeans arrived, indigenous peoples traded up and down the Pacific coast as far as Mexico and Alaska and even across the Pacific to Polynesia. We have an important role to play now in the Canadian economy, Asu says. All right, we will stop there. And I wanna give you, I know there was some challenging names in there, and let's see here. So it says wilder we, there was wilderness guest lodges in Hada, Gwai, 
and I'm not even sure if I'm saying that right. It's H-A-I-D-A, -A, new word, capital G-W-A-I-I. -I. The, the Hada home islands off the North British Columbia coast. And I know there were a few others and I apologize. I wanna I wanted to at least spell them for you. Oh, the country's heritage ranges from Inuit I N U I T to Athabascan A T H A B A S C A N and then it went on to, it said East Indian, Hindustani, Hindustani, yeah, so. But those were some some of the challenging words. All right. Let's get back to, let's try a little bit from our closing argument. When we last were reading from this closing argument, we were talking about squiggle, squiggly lines. All right, ready? Here we go. You can see them better when you get the exhibits back in the jury room. So it very well and most likely is that the tire impressions with the squiggly lines were made by this golf cart when the golf cart was operating because the defendant was seen driving it. Also, would a burglar do this? We have evidence here that the burglary was, the quote, burglary was staged. That's been seen by the damaged door. The crowbar is placed on the kitchen door in between items that would fall over if a little pressure is applied, like a roll of paper towels. Now, would a burglar be careful? Why would a burglar place the crowbar so carefully on the counter? I mean a real burglar. Imagine a burglar takes a crowbar breaks into this house and what is he going to do with the crowbar afterwards probably just going to throw it away but if he does bring it to the house he's going to just throw it down in the house or something or maybe he will walk through it holding it as a weapon in case somebody is there. He's not going to place it gingerly on the counter. If he does put it on the counter, he's just going to toss it. But that paper towel was still up. So when the defendant broke into his own house to make it look like a burglary, he placed it there. He just wasn't thinking properly. The fact that it was placed gingerly to not knock stuff over indicates someone other than a burglar put it there. Would a burglar pass that up? The drawer in this house was pulled open and you can see there's an envelope with big blue letters general funds and the testimony was it had cash in it. The defense might say, well, you know, the burglar was surprised by the victim driving up. Well, the fact is, even if he has was surprised, later he took the time to pull that drawer open and he saw an envelope that says general funds. He's going to just immediately pick it up. Why would he leave it alone? It had $25 in cash. A real burglar would have instantly opened 
that up and pocketed the cash. When you think of this burglary idea, the whole idea doesn't make sense. In order for this to happen, a burglar has to break in, carefully place the pry bar on the counter, and he has to pass up an envelope of cash marked as general funds. He has to hear Ms. Rios come home and search for a gun somewhere in the house. Then he finds the defendant's pistol in the holster in the case that he holds. All right, we will stop there. And that will conclude our literary and jury charge practice.